Hello, I'm Picantia Blackbird, the Blackbird Grimoire. Welcome back to Pagan Tales. Today, we are going to be focusing upon Baldur and Hell, or as she is sometimes called, Hela. So just as a super brief review, Baldur is the Norse god of life, life and fertility, vitality rather. He's the son of Og and Odin and Frigga, and ultimately he represents renewal. Hel or Hela, she is the Norse goddess of darkness, death, and the realm of the dead. She's the daughter of Loki and Angraboda, and she represents endings. <clears throat> so, here's why we are talking about them in the context of gods and goddesses of the underworld. Because the question has been raised by uh, more people than just myself, and as I've encountered more pagans throughout the years, it's coming up with greater regularity. Are Baldur and Hell the Norse equivalent of Hades and Persephone? Now, I want to begin by fully acknowledging that the question itself is highly controversial in Norse circles, and that some heathens who are kind enough to tune into my channel on occasion, they might be reaching for their smelling salts. I understand. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to get anyone's nose out of joint. I just want to, to just think this matter through and uh, just determine whether or not there is a reasonable case for this kind of interpretation. So let's begin with a few uh, facts that we do know. <clears throat> so beginning, pagan lore in general has strong seasonal connotations and metaphors for the cycle of life, death, and rebirth. This is a pattern we see over and over again. So it is natural to look for instances of this being repeated within the Norse mythos. Another fact is that we know that Snorri approached the Norse lore from a Christian mindset, and he did tweak things to better accommodate his worldview, which is why it is such a tangle figuring out uh, what is strictly more so of the pagan realm, where did his Christian mindset uh, get things twisted, how can we possibly untwist it? There's a reason, I mean, that alone is one of the reasons why there's so many uh, academic controversies on the Norse mythos side of things, it's just because uh, someone a long time ago made a decision because uh, he wanted to make stories people were familiar with more compatible with his worldview. And he also didn't want to get in trouble with the church, no doubt, you know, for, you know, um, for, uh, let's see, how should I put this, uh, for recording what the church would consider to be heresies. Uh, there, there's a lot of reasons why, you know, alterations were made, but we have to go into any examination of the topic with saying, you know, hey, he had an agenda here, and uh, we're going to have to take that agenda into account and figure out where we can unplug it. Uh, another fact is that by tradition, Baldur is believed to have been born on the winter solstice, hence why we have the celebration of Mother's Night in Frigga's honor, uh, which is uh, the night before the winter solstice. And this also symbolizes the return of the light and by extension, the eventual return of life itself, because without life, there can be no life because you know, we are dependent upon the sun in order to keep this whole offer going on Earth. Uh, so we have that association. Then the next one is that traditionally Baldur's death is considered to have been taken place on the summer, summer solstice, you know, courtesy of his twin Baldur, uh, who was associated with the dark and the cold and, you know, with an assist from Loki, which I acknowledge and we all know. Uh, so, you know, so we have this, uh, we have this already established, you know, born on the winter solstice, died on the summer solstice. Uh, that's, uh, that's a very familiar concept to anyone who's coming from a witchcraft background about life returning on the solstice. Uh, in the winter and life starting to end on the summer solstice and this going in a great big pattern. And because of Baldur's symbolism as and uh, relation to his twins, you know, they're on opposite ends of the spectrum. Baldur's the light and the life and the warmth and whereas Holder is darkness, cold, and because of his uh, hand in uh, Baldur's death, you know, also associated with death. Uh, so you already have that dynamic. Uh, so that also kind of lends to this idea of, you know, maybe this was all cyclical. Uh, next, uh, we know from the mythos is that after Baldur's death, he goes to Helheim and he is granted a place of honor by Hel. You know, she was he was actually uh, seated next to her in, in the essentially the throne area. And then we also know that uh, his resurrection was blocked. You know, all the creation had to weep for him and everyone did except for one old woman, I think was a giantess. And it's thought to have been Loki in disguise. And we also know that Baldur is one of the gods who returned to restore Earth post Ragnarok. Well, I suppose Midgard, I suppose, would be uh, 
uh, better to say than Earth. But he, nevertheless, he returns uh, post Ragnarok. He emerges back from hell. He comes back and he's part of the restoration. One of the few gods who's explicitly said that he does renew. Uh, <clears throat> Then on Hell's side, we know that she was forcibly put into the underworld because the gods feared her and her brothers because they were prophesied to have uh, be uh, major players in actually bringing about Ragnarok itself. Funny how, you know, actually banishing them ahead of time before crimes have been committed that actually uh, made Ragnarok an inevitability. But, you know, that's a different topic for a different video. Uh, we also know that Hell was single. She was without suitors. I mean, she was in the older underworld. She was a ruler. Uh, but, you know, there was nothing said about her, you know, having uh, a partner in life. And uh, we know that suddenly here's Baldur tossed into her his realm, her realm, and Baldur was considered to be the most desirable of all of the gods. Then we add on to this that Odin and Loki are blood brothers. So, and we know that uh, fathers of particularly in past times, uh, thought nothing of arranging marriages for their children. It, in fact, it was one of their responsibilities, uh, if not to outright arrange, at least certainly to approve. Um, so it really isn't outside of the realm uh, that they would seek to find a way to join their houses. And because Odin know that, knew that uh, this whole thing with Ragnarok and the ultimate renewal was inevitably going to happen. Loki knew that as well. So the idea of, hey, hell's always going to be around. Hell comes from Loki's side. Baldur is going to be renewing because of the prophecy. So putting them in each other's company, you know, if not uh, outright, to sin essentially seeking to, to marry them, which the, no the Lord, Lord does not state, but let's say that was the intention. Um, that that does make sense. You have the union between the two. You have the union between the two biggest players in the Norse pantheon. Uh, so a lot of this does kind of make some uh, rational sense if we're looking at the whole puzzle together. So let's look into it a little bit deeper. If, as is likely, it was Loki who uh, is the one who blocked Baldur's immediate resurrection, that blockage would actually serve several purposes. For one, it ensures uh, the upholding of the seasonal shift from summer to winter as is necessary. Then, because Baldur was safely locked away in hell, uh, his security through Ragnarok was ensured. Nothing would prevent his return from the conflict because he wasn't there to die again and he wouldn't have to go through a whole thing. He could simply emerge once the rest of uh, the gods emerged. So, this would also, again, a possible alliance between Baldur and Hell, whether in the spirit of cooperation or a closer relationship, uh, which I think is at least plausible. I mean, at least plausible. It does serve that purpose. And I think it is also possible that the whole cycle of Norse myth was initially understood to be representative of the shift of the seasons in different ages of the world. Because, again, this is the pattern that we see over and over again and without, throughout pagan mythos. Uh, now, we can't know for sure, of course, uh, but perhaps it was Snorri that distorted the myth into making Ragnarok appear like this one-time world-ending event as opposed to, uh, you know, this, this is going to happen all the time. Instead of uh, one of the signs of Ragnarok coming was, you know, the three years of winter. Well, what if instead of, you know, the three years, what if it was, you know, a season or three months uh, as a uh, winter tends to be a little bit more for many areas of the world now? Uh, you know, and, you know, again, we don't know, but it's plausible. And if that is the case, then I think we do need to rethink our interpretations because, it's possible that by operating on this false premise that Ragnarok is a future event, it's a one-time event, uh, it has nothing to do with the si seasonal cycles or anything else like that. I think that if we operate on that premise and only on that premise, we really get the wrong end of the stick and it's uh, preventing us from seeing that perhaps there's other stuff going on here. So I'm just tossing that out there as a possibility. So all things considered, it doesn't seem unreasonable to me to conclude that it is at least possible that Baldur and Hell are the Norse equivalents of Hades and Persephone. And I do think it is possible that Baldur and Hell may have formed a closer relationship, even though it hasn't been explicitly stated. Uh, we do know that Baldur's first wife, uh, Nana, does disappear from the narrative after his death. You know, he died uh, You know, while they were having his funeral. Uh, she died, I think, uh, ostensibly of a broken heart, and that that was it. We we do not hear of Nana again. Uh, so if Baldur and Hell 
uh, were thrown together. And, you know, Nana wasn't around Balder and, and the afterlife, so far as we know. And if Balder and Hell became close, or at least formed an alliance of some kind, that does constitute uh, the union of life and death that is frequently seen in pagan mythos all of the time. They are the opposites of the cycle. They provide completion and balance to each other. And Baldur's emergence from death to renew the world is much like spring following winter, much like Persephone emerging from the underworld, you know, to go back to her mother. And, uh, and of course, hell is the constant of death in the afterlife, just as Hades is the constant of death in the afterlife. So it fits a lot of pieces together. I know it's not a traditional interpretation. I know that some people might be, uh, you know, reaching for those smelling salts, and I, I understand. Um, and of course, I'm not saying that, you know, definitively everyone must accept this interpretation. That's just the way it's going to be. That is not the purpose of this video. Uh, but I do think that it's worth entertaining the idea. It's worth thinking it over uh, because we do see these consistencies and other mythological patterns. And it just, it seems like it makes sense on multiple levels. So uh, that is a uh, my take on it. Uh, next week, uh, we're going to be talking about the Morgan and Cronos in regards to death and the afterlife and the underworld and all such. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, let me know what you think of this theory. Um, do you uh, just what do you think? <laughs> let me know in the comments. And uh, of course, uh, please come back next week for uh, the next installment. But uh, bye for now.